live from their home studios. Please welcome the hosts of Deaf Central Connects, Boo Lamb and Jason Rom. Well, hello, Deb Central community. My name is Boo, and I'm your host today on Deb Central Connects. Today is actually a special bonus episode. So in November, we actually have five Tuesdays. And if you're familiar with our lineup, normally we have four Tuesday shows. So you get an extra bonus Deb Central Connects. However, we didn't have one last week because it was Thanksgiving, at least in uh, the United States. And so I, I'm in Canada, so I didn't get to enjoy any turkey last week. But uh, many of my coworkers did, so uh, that was great for them. Um, today, though, we've got this uh, super special episode because what we're going to be doing is going to be extra fun. I'm not going to uh, steal any thunder from Jason, though. I'll let him kind of describe what we're going to do, but it's going to be interactive. So if you are watching now and you're watching maybe from a mobile device, an iPad, or on your TV even, you might want to hop onto your laptop so that you can participate with us because uh, there is audience participation. Uh, today. So that should be fun. Um, speaking of co-hosts, though, and I mentioned Jason, I will bring on Jason right now. Jason, how you doing? I am quite well. And, you know, even though in the United States we did celebrate Thanksgiving and, and Turkey Day, I did not get any turkey. We were out in, yeah. in California for the week and we were with family, but uh, we had ham and we had some rotisserie chickens, but no turkey. So... Oh, wow. I'm going to have to rectify that. I'm going to have to get a turkey this week and throw it in the oven. <laughs> yeah, actually. So I'm going to have two questions for you. One of them I actually already know the question or already know the answer for, I believe. But and I think you guys have debated this before. Is it you didn't mention it? Is it pecan pie or pecan pie? Um, you know, in my history, I have I've said it both ways. My my dad's dad was a huge pecan pie uh, but I, it just feels wrong to say it, although I, it's yeah. uh, it's affectionate to say it that way. But yeah, pecan would be my my phrase of choice. Or I mean, my pronunciation of choice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I wonder where the two kind of diverged. And uh... I'm I'm not offended by either, though. <laughs> yeah. I'll gladly eat. Just bring me the pie. the pie. You can call yeah. it whatever you want. Just bring it, and I will eat it. <laughs> Same here. Um, so here's my next question. And anybody who's watching right now, even if you're watching the replay, I, I would love if you wanted to uh, chime in in the comments on this. I think this is a question that um, can apply to almost anyone in the world. But uh, Jason, for you, what is your favorite ride at Disney for everybody who's watching? This could be Disneyland, Disney World, Euro Disney, Ooh. any of the Disneys around the world. Um, feel free to chime in. But Jason, what is your favorite ride at Disney? Wow. Um, favorite. Um, the, I mean, the first, I guess I'll say the first one that came to mind, it was the Aerosmith rock and coaster at the time it was MGM studios. I don't even know if that exists anymore because I haven't heard anything about MGM studios. So maybe they've rebranded that, that park or whatever, but the, the Aerosmith rock and coaster at MGM studios is, was probably my favorite. Wow. How about you? For me, uh, the the new Star Wars um, area had the they got the two rides right. They got the Millennium Falcon ride, and they have the, mm -hmm. uh, the like the big ride. At least when I had gone um, last to Disney, it was actually early 2020, right before lockdown started to happen. And mm -hmm. this ride had only just opened a few months earlier, I believe, or maybe it was like six months earlier. It was one of those ones where they had a special way to actually request the tickets for them. You had to. Um, be there at opening and then use the app to request your ticket. I can't remember what it's called, but it's one where you sit in the pod with, I think. Yeah, the Rise of the Resistance. I th that's it. Yeah. It was just, it was epic. Like, there's no other way to explain it. There's just like huge um, landscapes that you're going through the, weaving through the AT-ATs uh, kind of things. It was, uh, it was pretty neat. Did you get to go on that one? No, the, they had the virtual queue. That you have to like, you know, punch everything in, and uh, by the time that we even got the app opened, people next to us like it's already full. It was like eight seconds, <laughs> and the whole thing was booked for the whole day. So yeah, oh, we wow. we didn't get in unfortunately. Yeah, it took us uh, it took us a couple tries to, a couple days of trying to actually get into that one, but uh, it's a reason to go back. Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. So if anyone in the comments, you can you can drop a comment live here. If you're watching the replay, please uh, please leave a comment. We'd love to see what everybody else thinks about that, and and could be could apply to any of the other uh, Disney's as well. Yeah, we we had a very unseasonably warm day. It was uh, 87, mm -hmm. uh, which is I think 30 30 31 Celsius. Um, it was like 87 degrees that day. So we we had a pretty warm day at at Disney. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's cool. All right. So today, this is a special episode because this is something that we've never tried before. You've never tried before. No. You, you got this up and running yesterday, Jason. So why don't you talk us through uh, what's going to happen today and what people need to set up in order for them to uh, to participate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll go ahead and and share us here. This is uh, this is Vir uh, Visual Studio Code. It is, uh, you know, a, a free download you can put on your your desktop, whether it's Windows, Linux, uh, Mac and uh, and they have this live share functionality. It's an extension that you install and it allows us to be collaborating in a project together. And so this is the guest book page. If you, if you join us, um, you know, log in and, and, uh, and, and leave us a, a note that you were here and that would be great. But, uh, uh, yeah. So, um, John Capo Bianca, who's been on our show before, um, he does has done this in some of his uh, live streams, and so I spent some time with him yesterday morning, and he he just kind of helped me uh, set up. And we're not going to do this today, but one of the things he showed me yesterday is like he can share out his um, even his own terminal and uh, and his containers. And so when you join the live share session, it port forwards for you. Um, Web server dude, join the collab session. All right, nice. welcome. Yeah, so you know uh, you can port forward. So uh, in the future, I'll be able to even port forward uh, for my big IP that's running on my laptop, and they can run the the I rules live from the environment that we're at. So that's kind of oh, cool. wow. Yeah, very cool. But, yeah, but what what we're gonna do today is we're gonna walk through how you go about updating I rules. And before we do a couple of these live, what I'd like to do is is look at uh, a a particular I rule that was rewritten three times um, that's out in the code share. And that's the DNS flood protection I rule. And I think um, his original dev central name was Natty 76. Um, and it's a Nat Thoracicorn, I think is how his name is said. Uh, he's an employee. Um, and he went through several iterations of this over time. And the cool thing about this particular rule is it was written before uh, you know, static variables were available. It was even written before uh, CMP. Uh, uh, where, where's my privacy now? Everybody knows my GitHub handle. Sorry, Daniel. Uh, <laughs> so, um, although if you wouldn't have uh, commented on that, we wouldn't have been able to associate it, Daniel. So yeah. now you gave us the final piece there. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna call you out on that one. We, we um, could fix that in post. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so this one was written even before there were CMP systems, um, the clustered multiprocessing. And so what, what happens with, uh, global variables, and we'll just slide down here and take a look at this first iteration. Um, let me make that a little bigger so you guys can see the text a little better, or at least, you know, my old man eyes, uh, will assume for you that you also can't see it, but, uh, back in the day before CMP, uh, global variables were totally acceptable. Uh, and so they were used quite a bit. And the problem with global variables, however, with uh, uh, clustered systems is that it demotes the virtual server from the ability to use multiple cores. And so if you have a global variable on there in your iRule, not only does it, it affect the connections of that are using that I rule, but all connections for that virtual server. So if you have, uh, you know, multiple services running in that virtual server um, and they wouldn't necessarily touch this rule, um, it doesn't matter. It affects all of them. And so global variables, modern systems, bad. And so, you know, that's one of the things that this rule did. Uh, but he also used uh, an array and he would apply, uh, you know, different key value pairs into that array, uh, also global variables, uh, in order to do that. And so basically, you know, just kind of setting and unsetting variables based on the, the timing. And I think in this one, he's even using the current. Yeah. So they're, they're clocking seconds and, and all that kind of thing in this rule. So if we go to version two of that, 
you can see that that uh, you know the rule in it is gone. All the global variables are gone, and and uh, now using the session table, um, not tables yet because in this version table command uh, did not uh, did not exi exist exist. Uh, but they're they're using so a lot of the logic is still kind of the same. Still using the the clock command in order to uh, to time these things, and then adding and removing. Uh, from the session table based upon how, how frequently they're coming through. Third iteration of this rule now is using the static memory um, namespace. So you can hold variables in the static namespace and those are able to be shared um, in a, uh, you know, CMP compatible way amongst the cores. And then, and then of course they're using the table command. And uh, the only difference between the table command and the session command, they're hitting the same memory spaces um, is that there's more functionality available in with the table command. And so uh, you can use uh, the concept of subtables in there, uh, but you can also touch keys without um, without impacting their timestamps, which you can't do with the session table. And so there were uh, there were updates there, uh, but no global variables, so not demoted from CMP, and then additional functionality that, that cleans up the logic. You can tell here that most of this rule here is comments. Whereas if you come back in this, you know, this is 31 lines long and very few comments. And so just with the iteration of functionality over the years, you're able to clean up uh, the amount of space you're using in the iRule, but also the, the logic is, is a lot simpler and easier to follow. And the only other follow-up there on, uh, on version 3.1 uh, is that... Uh, just to protect like in an, in an incident where the flooding is, uh, is extreme, uh, that you're going to protect the memory of your own big IP. And so, uh, so this one just manages that a little better. So ads, uh, you know, you can tell this one's a lot longer, um, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's tracking each individual, uh, queue depth. And, and then of course, this is a separate rule that allows you to see how many, uh, requests and, and what that you're blocking, uh, or the, the, yeah, total number of table entries, uh, that are in there. And so this is a, a, a separate I rule, uh, from the logic of, of managing that memory, uh, to be able to just peek into that. I will say if you're writing I rules and you're concerned about performance, especially if this I rule was applied, um, to, uh, a, a virtual that had other, um, other traffic on it, that you're anytime you do a for loop, you, that's that's a blocking function. Um, you're not setting like an after command. We'll set it and that'll park that until it's solved whatever it needs to solve, and then it, and then it comes back into the loop. Uh, a for loop is actually going to impact traffic, so you need to be careful with that. Um, but you know if this is sitting on its own virtual, no other traffic is going through that. Uh, you know that kind of iron rule is fine. Um, but that is the kind of the walkthrough of the progression of, of why you would want to write I rules because sometimes you, um, sometimes you, you know, you set it and you forget it, right? You build something and it's like, Oh, I'm done with that. Let's move on to something else. And, uh, and uh, web server dude or Daniel, if you want to sign the guest book, I would appreciate it uh, on the guestbook.md file. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move into rewriting our first I rule. And, uh, and Daniel, if you want to help with that, um, you are free uh, to do that. And so, Boo, thank you. You're signing in as, as we go over here. So cool thing about this is I can, Boo can work in this other field on, on Guestbook while I'm over here. And, uh, and I just know that, um, you know, he's moving around in the system. Uh, I can see where they are. And that, that's kind of cool. And so we'll get better at this over time as, as we use it more. Uh, but we're going to rewrite this first one. And so let's just kind of talk through it first. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I meant, I, I don't, I'm not actively mentoring right now with robotics, but I mentored for a few years and, and uh, hoping to get back to that uh, after little man gets a, a little bit older. But um, one of the things that, that I always worked with them is like, Hey, let's, let's sit down before you write code and let's think through things. Let's flow chart. Um, in this case, we already have code written, so it's it's not as important to flowchart, but it's still important to kind of walk through what was the intent of what was going on here, uh, so you don't just start changing things and then you 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 don't know where you started and, and why you're updating it in the first place. 
So for per HTTP request, um, we're going to find a match using the host and the URI against a uh, class, in this case, a you know data group. And that's one of the things with nomenclatures like in, is it a class? Is it a data group? It's, it's called different things in different places. Um, but in this case, uh, the find class is a, a defined data group on the, on the system. And when it finds that, um, it's going to take the current host and URI, and it's going to look in this red list. Now, uh, this should jump out at you as that that's not good. Um, the dollar sign colon colon that's telling me global variable format. Now, again, this is a, a data group. Um, and in fact, it will go, we'll go check find class out here. We'll learn a couple things about that. Um, but then if there, um, if it found something, uh, where this is uh, not equal to, um, if it's not equal to nothing, essentially an empty string, then I'm going to scan scan. That's a good use there. Uh, scan is an awesome command. It's very performant. Um, and I'm going to break that. Uh, I'm going to look at that and I'm going to put that into three strings. So I'm guessing I don't have a data group from this code share entry, but I'm guessing that uh, that data group entry was, you know, three chunks of string. Uh, the first being the, the HTTP host URI. I'm pointing, but you can't see me or what I'm pointing to. So I'll highlight it. <laughs> um, you know, I'm looking at uh, this. That'll be my first. And then whatever host they want to rewrite that as. And then the URI separated by white space. And so um, I don't have a data group to test that against, so I'm going to have to build one. And we'll do that in here in a second. And then, so if the host is not equal uh, to an empty string, we're going to replace it. If the URI is not equal to an empty string, we're going to replace that. I'm curious why their ifs are separate uh, on this. I don't really have the context for the background, um, but I would imagine that you would want both of those things to be true. Um, maybe there's a use case where, where they wouldn't need to be. Uh, but I, I would think you'd want to match both, um, not one or the other. And in the, in the way that this is written, uh, you can you replace the URI without the host or the host without the URI. Uh, so that might be something that we consider cleaning up. Uh, the scan command itself, I probably wouldn't change that. That's a really performant way to do things. Um, but we do need to swap this out because find class is actually a deprecated command. Um, and you know these things uh, either through experience or you spend time in the documentation. So let's go over the documentation real quick and look at that. So the uh, the iRules API documentation is out on Cloud Docs and it's under cloudocs.f5.com slash API slash iRules. That's, that's pretty simple. Um, the commands that don't have a whole lot of commands under them from a namespace perspective all go in global. Um, so like something like HTTP, there's like 30 commands in HTTP. So they have their own little section that'll be listed here on the left side. Uh, but for ones that are like one-offs, they're, they're all under global. And so find class, uh, is here in the list. And so if we go up to here, uh, we know that find class, uh, oh, it says a note here has been deprecated in V10. So we're on V16 now. Uh, so the class command has been out for a long time. And in 10, you could run both. It was deprecated, but it was uh, still functional. I don't know. I, I don't know if it was actually ever fully removed. Does find class still work? I don't know if it does or not. Um, but uh, but it was deprecated, and class is far more performant, so she, so you should use it. Uh, but it also says here, and and you know, I, I uh, mentioned that you know with this dollar sign colon colon uh, for referencing the class that still worked in V10. Uh, but once V11 came, uh, that results in an error and a TCP reset. So that's that's bad juju. You don't want that. And so we can clean that up a little bit. So it says to use the class command. So let's go over here and look at the class page. And of course, it's got a reference back to find class that hey, if you're if you're showing up here, definitely don't want to use this format at all um, to prefix your class. So. If we come down to class match, uh, we can see that I'm going to look at a URI and, and then I have an operator. So uh, there's options in here. And then the item I'm actually going to look at, I'm going to evaluate that with an operator. And then I'm going to look at the class. Okay. So if we go back here, we would maybe rewrite this. And, and uh, at this point, let's just put that out of service and 
Uh, Daniel, if you want to jump in here at all and rewrite anything I do, feel free to do that. Um, but set your eye and, uh, you know, I don't think we need, uh, we need the class command here. Right. And then we wanted HTTP post. And by the way, if you're seeing this uh, command completion that I'm doing, this is because of the uh, F5 uh, I rules uh, extension in VS Code. So that's an other, another extension. Okay, so I'm going to look at that. I didn't use any options here, um, but if I want the value here, I can do that. If I want it to return the value. If you don't have uh, the value or the index or, you know, what are the other options are, it's going to return like a Boolean, I think is what the the thing said. Yeah. If no option specified, the return value is one for a match or zero for a no match. Uh, so down here, we can look at the actual search arguments um, and then value changes the return value to be the value of the matching class element. Okay. So the value and then our uh, item, which we did, and then the operator the operator here is we want to be um, starts with. Because we're going to have three strings, right? And we're only matching the first part of that. So we want that to be starts with. And then uh, we have a class, red list. Now, on my big IP, I don't actually have uh, a a uh, class named red list. Um, so, okay. Daniel says, no, it doesn't work any longer. So that's, uh, that's good to know. Um, and, and so now I think we have what we need now. One thing I would change here. So this is just kind of the, the rewrite of this. One thing I would change here is that um, if I am with HTTP URI, that one is, uh, could be, Oh, we're getting a, uh, comment from web server. Well, let's see what he says um, on what the change is, because I was about to say it, but I'll give him a chance to type it out. Oh, down here, just uh, class value starts with red list. Not set and move here. Yeah, that's possible, but I, I think because they had two different fields that... Uh, they're wanting to replace the host header, but then also setting the URI. Uh, so because we have the second piece of that, we would have to do a, um, we'd have to do an L index of whatever's returned, or uh, we still have to scan out that information because of the way the data class was written. So, you know, that's a, that's a good idea to not set variables if you don't have to. But in this case, because of the way it was written, um, then, you know, and, and maybe we don't write the data group that way, um, but they have two pieces of information they're trying to pull out, the, the URI and, and the host, and, and how, we, how we write the, the data group, because we could, if we come down here uh, where you guys are looking, if, if I wrote the, the data group entries as, um, you know, let's say devcentral.f5.com, let me take the the lead off of that. If I just had that slash S slash articles, but I want to change that to um, the C.F5.com slash articles, you know, if I, if I did it that way and I didn't have it separated by space, then I could totally um, just do a full redirect or, or maybe even do a get field to pull out each piece of that. Uh, by splitting it by the uh, thing. So I'm operating on that. But I think performance-wise, it would be faster to just go ahead and scan and use the variable. Um, but in a future in a future show, maybe, maybe we do the testing. Um, could you use the scan on... Yeah, you could do it completely in line for sure. Um, but scan returns multiple values. So you would you would just have to then uh, maybe scan itself probably wouldn't because you're you're scanning these strings into um, these different bodies. Now you could scan it out and not store the other ones, uh, but your scan stores to a, a, a variable. And so 
there are different ways to accomplish what you're talking about, um, Daniel, for sure. And and I think that it would be um, maybe another show. We actually end up with two or three solutions and then we'll test them all. And we can test them uh, by how the processor is responding uh, with requests against it. And we can also do a stack um, uh, a stack trace uh, against the byte code and do that. So maybe maybe the next bonus show, or maybe I'll just do it on a uh, one of my episodes of the core. Uh, we'll 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 do some eye rule testing and and kind of look at that. Um, but on on this one, let's go ahead and and I wanted to say one thing about this: the HTTP URI that you're matching from the data class is going to be maybe it's going to be all lowercase, maybe it's all going to be uppercase. But one thing I would change here especially if I'm writing a static um, if I'm writing a static uh, class is I would I would actually put a, a, a to lower on is that okay I'd do a string to lower on that URI so that what I'm matching in the class uh, will definitely match uh, it's not required for the host because well at least the RFC uh, states that the the host should be lowercase period um, so unless you have uh, bad actors coming against you with the uh, with capital letters, then uh, you should be good to go. I got a I got a sideband message, Jason. Somebody's wondering if that should actually be class match value. Oh yeah, it should totally. Thank you. All right, thanks, Stephen. Yep. And uh, good to go. So we have permits argument injection and okay. So we get a little comment here. Uh, add to terminate options. Okay, so a little tech tip there, right in the, uh, and this is a Bitwise Cook, um, one of the, uh, I guess that's his, uh, you know, get handle or, or whatever. But he's he's got this uh, this iRules extension out on the the market share. All right, so the other thing that I would rewrite here is um, I would probably make sure the scan we're well we're, we're we're making sure we match something here so i would probably if this were me um no oh, sorry that part i'd leave alone and uh after the scan is probably what i would change um i would probably do if host is not equal and URI not equal, then I would pull this stuff out and then and then call that good. So not a whole lot of changes. Go ahead. Uh, we get a comment here too. From Josh, I've been including the HTTP has responded logic. Okay. So, um, Josh, if are you joined in the live share? So, um, maybe comment what uh, I haven't added that. So it's been a while since I've been actively I rule writing, and uh, and and maybe a little of my rust is showing. But uh, what what is your has responded logic? Let's go to the HTTP. Oh, I, I think so. Are you saying, uh, Josh, uh, for being able to do this, that uh, if if you're writing many I rules that are going on a virtual server, um, that uh, that sometimes they'll trip over each other and you end up with a, a, a TCP reset because um, either you're trying to, um, or you're just getting uh, uh, full logs because you have uh, tried to call a redirect um, later when you've already called the redirect or respond after a respond. Anyway, anyway, weigh in on that. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. 
So I think what he's saying here is that, uh, so we pull that out, but maybe we, let me look at that again and not, so we, and well, I'm, I'm doubting myself now. Let me look for operators because I don't know if you saw that uh, response there. Yeah, that's that's what is yeah okay. the multiple uh, rule issues. So, yep. Yeah. So yeah, my syntax is a little shaky, but um, and not. Something like that. So, anyway, I'll I'll test that later because we're we're actually you know at time, aren't we? So <laughs> that took a lot longer to That's go through cool. one uh, than I thought than I thought it would be. But um, you know, I'll test this and I'll get it uploaded and uh, and shared out tomorrow. I'm also going to rewrite this other one a little bit later, and these will both come out with uh, come confirmed uh, they work on my my big IP. And uh, let's see, could you use a scan as a string? Yeah. Yep. So um, I'll, I'll test these. I'll get the HTTP has responded. That's a good tip, uh, Josh, uh, for sure. Uh, not to derail at all. That's why we're here. We're doing this live because I want this to be interactive. So that's, uh, that's totally why we're here. And, uh, and so that's good that you're helping me because I've been out of the active development game for a while and and really anything that i do is in a vacuum because i i don't i'm not responsible for anything operational there was a time uh many years ago when when you know john wagnon and i were actively managing dev central infrastructure in front of the dev central platform and so i was writing i rules and john was writing asm policies and we were managing servers and and backups and all of those things and so uh, there was a time where I was, you know, in the trenches working on all this stuff, but now it's all theory and, and, and fun, uh, from a standpoint of, of building these things. And so I'm, uh, I'm all for, uh, the, the interaction and the engagement and the pushback, because this is how I would rewrite it, uh, being a rusty, I rule developer. Um, but everyone else, uh, you know, um, you know, Daniel, you have thoughts is like, yeah, you would probably rewrite this a little bit. To be fair, I, I would probably, um, if I had more time uh, to think about it, I would probably change the way they did their data class uh, to make all of this a, a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. And so, you know, and that's the great thing about being able to iterate on things. Uh, you test it and it's like, well, that, that wasn't even as performant as the, the original version that then you go back to the, the drawing board because you, you want to have things that work functionally, but then you want to make them performant. And so that's, uh, that's part of the journey, but, um, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll keep iterating on that uh, a little bit later today. And, uh, you know, that, awesome. I think that was a, a good, a good first, uh, journey with the, the live sharing. I'm glad Daniel, thank you for getting in there and, and, and working with me. That was really good. And, and, uh, and being able to, you know, type in there, at least type uh, comments. That was really good. Uh, one more thing is the responded check must occur before testing any other HDD functions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, thanks for taking us through that, Jason. That was a super fun, um, uh, super fun exercise there. I think for everyone to go through, we had a lot of interaction on there. I love that the interaction was like real interact. Like we interact as far as comments, but it was like real interaction as far as like hands on keyboard work as well. So that was uh, pretty cool. Um, maybe a couple of shout outs here. I mean, um, hi to uh, Akshay. Um, we've said hi to Daniel and Josh. Thanks for participating with us today. Um, otherwise, if you haven't already, hit subscribe. We're on youtube.com slash devcentral. Follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. We have a couple shows that are coming up that we want to tell you about as well. Let's see here. This Thursday, it's actually me and you, Jason, back again. Dev Central Connects. This week is Naboo the, and Jason week. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And starting into the December lineup, I'm super excited about the December lineup because I was I was um, going through and, and putting together the promo card and I'm like, oh, this is going to be pretty fun. 
Another interactive one, I think, going over what our labs look like. You've got a lab at home that you work on, other things that, that we build as well. My lab, I just freshened that up a couple of weeks ago, um, specifically to, to talk about what we'll uh, talk about in the next show. But that should be fun. We'd love to hear what everybody else is doing for their labs as well. So that should be interactive. Can I interrupt you for a second? Yep. So I don't know if everybody can see this in the light here, this little F5 ball, you know? That came off of my one of my hardware big IPs uh, in my lab. So I've I've had hardware over the years. It, I'm all virtual now in cloud, but uh, uh, that's gonna I'm gonna mold that little F5 ball into an on-air uh, 3D printed uh, experience to go outside my door, so the family knows awesome. when I'm when I'm when I'm live. But uh, yeah, awesome. that 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 piece of hardware came off of a lab component. That's super cool. I've got, uh, yeah, we could talk about old relics that we have as well. I've got a 3600 uh, sitting down uh, down in the basement or in the crawl space. Um, let's see. Well, I've got, got a comment here from Josh going through a bunch of V13 and V14. Uh, so a change for the IRLs, something we've had in mind. Yeah, there we go. Yep, that comes up when you uh, when you do your upgrades. Yeah, can I say right. one, one more thing to, to everybody that's yep. holding on? If you if you've gone to the big IB commands and events by version, I, I try and make these as accurate as possible. But you know, every version as you go through, what's been added and what's been deprecated, and so uh, you know, go out there and check that out. The commands by version, so you have an idea of where you were and where you're going, and uh, you know, read your release notes because there are there are big changes sometimes. There's breaking changes sometimes. And so, you know, make make sure you stay aware of that. So, um, you know, good good on you, Josh, for for working through that process. <laughs> hey, jo you know, Josh, on that, I don't have a an F five ornament, um, but I did uh, get a notice that there is an F five ugly sweater coming my way for December. <laughs> so, if if it arrives before our last show. Um, I'll, I'll either have that or the beanie, um, you know, for, uh, for the show. So, you know, tune in. <laughs> that should be cool. Um, yeah, 3d or, or, uh, NF5 ornament, we could, uh, produce those with, uh, 3d printers perhaps. And then, uh, yeah, that's true. And get those going. Send those okay, out so. as uh, comment gifts. Right? <laughs> yeah. Swag. Good call. Um, okay. Next Monday at the edge. So I'll actually be on this one. How to pass the uh, certified Kubernetes admin exam. Oh, sorry, that was a little bit backwards there when I typed it in. Um, so the CKA by the CNCF, a bunch of acronyms there, but this is like the Kubernetes administrator exam. And one of my colleagues, one of our colleagues, Michael O'Leary recently passed that exam. A lot of people are looking at that exam right now. And so he's got some tips that he's gonna share with us on passing that exam. Why this comes up for uh, at the edge is that if you haven't looked at the Voltaire platform already, there's two parts of it. There's a uh, Volt stack and Volt mesh. And the Volt stack piece is a virtual Kubernetes stack that allows you to run a globally distributed Kubernetes from a single interface. Super cool, gives you uh, most of the uh, kubectl commands. And so it's gonna be important to, to learn these types of skills. And I would relate it back to like VMware. When I, when I went into consulting, I came into consulting as a network engineer, but I had to learn VMware and I actually wrote my uh, VCP, my VMware certified um, uh, practitioner uh, exam, um, even though I wasn't going to be implementing uh, VMware, but it was important to learn and, and Kubernetes, I would say it's the same. Uh, next, this one here, if you wanna talk about that one, uh, Jason, Dev Central Connects on uh, the 9th. Yeah, so um, I think John and I are doing that show and um, and that's that's going to be all about the quick protocol and and diving into the weeds of you know why did why did you know HTTP go away from TCP why is it going to um, you know the UDP based quick and uh, you know what are the implications what are the benefits and uh, you know I've done a, a light board on quick um, but uh, you know Martin Duke uh, who is the developer extraordinaire who's going to come drop science on us. So you'll, you'll want to be there for that show. Nice. Yeah, that'd be cool. 
Uh, we've got one from John. He's going to be doing security sidebar, real attack stories. Those ones are always fun. I actually shared back in the last top five, kind of like a real attack story about how one of my customers was getting DDoS and we were able to get them in front of, or get Silverline DDoS mitigation in front of them really quickly. So um, all these real stories are, are always interesting to hear about. Um, next, Dev Central Connects, where are they now? This should be an interesting one as well. We were thinking about this a few weeks ago and we we're thinking, you know what, there's actually a lot of Dev Central members that weren't with F5, uh, but worked on F5 that ended up joining F5 as employees. And they've did, done that along the way. All of them have been really successful in their careers. So we're gonna revisit with some of them and just check out what they're doing and kind of how they got to this point. Jason, you are one of them, right? I am, yeah, I was a... Uh, a customer before an employee and uh, um, a community member before and a, a steward of the community. Um, although I considered myself a steward of the community even before I was paid to be. So, you know, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That should be, uh, that should be pretty fun. And then this one again, Jason, back to you, the core. Yeah, the core. I, I actually, I think I'm going to shift it. I think I think we're going to do some I rules testing on on the 21st. So maybe I'll push cool. monitors out to January. But but now I I really want to dig into testing. So I'll I'll flesh out these two rules. Then we'll go through the process of of testing, both with just looking at at, at you know how the processor is handling those, uh, but then also dig into the stack tracing uh, capability of of Big IP and what that looks like. Um, in the log files, and then how you can uh, add all those log files into a stack trace um, and and run heat maps on that stuff. So we'll we'll dig into that on the twenty first. Awesome, yeah, that should be fun. All right, uh, thanks a lot, folks. Thanks for hanging on uh, right to the end too. We still have uh, a bunch of people who are still watching here, uh, even though we've gone over our allotted time. So thank you very much for everybody for watching today. Again, if you haven't already, hit subscribe on youtube.com slash devcentral. We're also on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. If those are your preferred methods of watching this show, that's fine as well. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, Jason, for taking us through that. And we will see you all on this Thursday. Bye, folks. Bye, everyone. This week on Dev Central Connects. Sweet home labs. Oh, sweet home. Lord, I'm coming home to you where the lights are blue. Every technologist needs their own personal R&D space. And just as the data center space has evolved over the years, so has personal lab in.